We're going to get started. Welcome to Unlocking WNYC's On the Line. It's going to be presented by Martha Bell, Ball, uh, who was the project cataloger at New York Public Radio for On the Line. She specializes in describing multi-format archival collections provided across the continent that address recent American history and culture. And joining her is Marcos Suero Ball, who is an archive manager at New York Public Radio, where he focuses on metadata workflows at scale. They'll be taking questions at the end, so you can put them in chat as well as Slack. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yes, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed a little preview of what we're going to be discussing today. That was a bit of digitized audio from On the Line, the August 24th, 1998 episode. I hope you can appreciate all the topics and guests and everything else that, that we cataloged with On the Line. Uh, we wanted to begin by just previewing the structure of our presentation. Um, we'll start with an introduction of our backgrounds and the background of digitization at New York Public Radio. We'll then give more of an overview of On the Line, the collection we use as a case study for creating a cataloging tool before delving into the details of this tool and how it was used for authority names, subject headings, and to normalize description. We'll then review the outcomes of this approach, sharing our results, lessons learned, and the valuable content we discovered through the process. And we'll end with Q&A and discussion, um, saving time for your questions. So feel free to put them in the chat now, or we'll remind you again when we get to that part of our presentation. Uh, let's get started. So just to begin, we'll set the stage for this presentation. Um, as our host mentioned, my name is Martha Ball, my pronouns are she, her, and I was the project cataloger for this collection. I completed catalog cataloging, excuse me, for On the Line between August, 2023 and July, 2024, working in really an iterative process to create these cataloging documents with Marcos. And my name is Marcos Suirobal. I'm the archive manager here at New York Public Radio, where I've been since uh, for 14 years. And yeah, I specialize in uh, metadata, mostly at scale. So let me tell you a little bit about New York Public Radio, which is um, where I work. New York Public Radio is the umbrella organization for several properties, including um, WYC Radio, WYC Radio started broadcasting on July 8th, 1924, and it started as a part of the city. So 100 years ago this year, um, the city decided they wanted to have this newfangled technology be useful to its citizens. So um, they started a radio station called WNYC. And um, it was part of the city for many, many decades until 1997 when uh, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, uh, managed to sell the station to um, a, a board. So this it became an independent entity that was uh, was and is since then still a nonprofit, but is um, basically the most of the funding comes from donations by listeners, listeners like you. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we are right now. And just to give a bit of context, the archives was not formally established uh, at WNYC until the year 2000 when our supervisor, Andy Lancet, uh, started. So there's been a lot of catching up. Um, a lot of uh, materials have been repatriated coming from any number of archives. And uh, as a result, the... Um, Metadata has been, uh, you know, in various degrees of uh, intellectual control. Not only we get the organization gets money from, uh, from listeners, but we also get uh, periodically, especially the archives, uh, grants. And in two thousand twenty one, in particular, we received our biggest one yet from a generous. Uh, uh, donor, the um, Leon Levy Foundation. And the money was to reformat um, physical audio carriers into digital audio files. And you can see here our ingest workflow, basically what, uh, what it um, tries to do is try to get as much information from the many disparate systems that exist within the station. 
we knew from the beginning that um, just the reformatting, the digitizing part was not going to be super helpful for our users because we already have hundreds of thousands of files that are poorly described. So we really wanted to make an effort to increase our intellectual control. And as you can see from the various disparate uh, systems, a lot of it uh, involved using APIs and, and XML transformations. So we try to also um, highlight some collections within the general collection so that we could have special um, kind of a proofs of concept of how far we can take um, the metadata route. And we uh, convinced our donors that maybe hiring a cataloger for some of these shows would be important and interesting. And that's how we were lucky enough to uh, get Martha to work with us for one year. I was lucky enough to listen to so much on the line. It's such a rich store show. And I saw why it was the perfect case study for this kind of deep dive into the guests and subjects um, by going through, through the collection. So we just wanted to give a snapshot here of this collection by the numbers. Uh, on the line ran from 1989 to 2002 when it was renamed the Brian Lehrer Show, still running today. It includes over 2,000 episodes in this initial run, uh, which includes over 9,000 guest entries and over 9,000 segments. So, so much rich content to be discovered. Um, the general subjects addressed Brian Lehrer and original producer Meg Luther with, were charged with creating an issues-oriented talk show with guests and Collins. And in response to this charge, they created an open line for experts and everyday New Yorkers alike to discuss the local, national, and international news that was directly impacting their work and lives. So this varied from continuing daily coverage of the Kosovo War, uh, numerous local and national election cycles, domestic events, including the Clinton impeachment trial and the September 11, 2001 attacks, as well as roundtables of everyday listeners, such as local New York high schoolers addressing issues of race in their schools, and conversations with leaders, including President Jimmy Carter, Ram Dass, Betty Friedan, and Cornell West. And here we just wanted to give an example of this kind of rich content. Uh, you'll hear a bit of a conversation between Betty Friedan and Mary Frances Berry during a feminist roundtable on On the Line on May 14th, 1990. <laughs> She gets out of college and she's asked, can you type? Or she she uh, um, she has a child or she has a divorce. It, uh, that, that, th th these things could uh, turn a woman into a feminist overnight. She's not so likely today to be asked, just can you type, if well, she gets out of college. But she still is going to find a whole new right, different right. world if she's working and she has a child. There is, let me bring a bit. There's too much, Mary Francis, Mary, go ahead. There's too much ethnocentrism in this discussion right now, with all due respect. Yeah, by the definition that uh, Betty Friedan just gave, and I'm not being disrespectful. Whenever I say anything that criticizes Betty Friedan, I get letters from people saying I'm being disrespectful. So I'm not being disrespectful. You can criticize <laughs> I'm, being disres I'm not being disrespectful, Betty. Uh, but the definition you just gave, uh, and that we use all the time, of what makes a feminist, it means that black women have always been feminists. Well, that's okay? true. And more feminists than anybody else. This is exactly the kind of dialogue that is preserved and made available through cataloging, implementing linked data for both these guests and for the subjects they address. So in creating a cataloging tool, we work to match on the line to desired outcomes and standards of digitization at New York Public Radio. Uh, you'll so see here our kind of input and output. We had many sources to pull from, and this process was made possible through data transformations from these sources, collecting all information to streamline human review and allow for relatively quick mass cataloging. See here our inputs on the left include an original producer database, existing description in the catalog, Library of Congress linked data, existing internal authorities in our CMS, which we'll delve a bit more into later on, Wikipedia linked data, uh, Google results for names and subjects, and available digitized audio and images to verify what we were finding. In the middle here will be our XHTML tool that Marcus will go deeper into. And then our desired outcomes of this tool were Library of Congress name authority file, permalink URLs, 
Library of Congress subject heading URLs and new internal authorities in the CMS while needed, as well as normalized titles and descriptions. We realized it was very important to have both the information and to have it parsable through normalized titles and descriptions so that future processes can be run on it. We started with authority names. Um, we knew this was very important to our users because we had done uh, some parsing of the um, request forms that we receive from our users, both internally within the station and outside, and names and dates were the two most important um, metadata points. So we were lucky that the current producers of the Brian Larry Show kept um, Microsoft Access database and from it, they gave us uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And the Excel spreadsheet basically had a list of one row per guest. And uh, you can see here an example. So from that uh, Excel spreadsheet, we created an XML document, which should have been a straightforward uh, affair. But as you can see, it, there were some things that made it a little more difficult. Uh, sometimes there were several guests in one um, segment. So you can see on the first column there that some segment names are repeated. So um, that was one way where they signified that this was the same segment, but also they use the word and sometimes, maybe because typing it too much, uh, too many times was uh, a little impractical. And then a further complication was that sometimes the same segment uh, had guests at different times. So, we try to figure out all these things um, and automatically uh, create an XML that we could work from. And one of the things that we did, for example, is to create an uh, ISO 8601 uh, daytime start and daytime end format. So we would be able to kind of make those decisions and in a more standardized way. From that uh, XML document that was a direct descendant of the original database, we used the Library of Congress API to create an HTML document that allowed uh, the cataloger, Martha, to select from possible matches in the Library of Congress. So in this case, for example, you have uh, Gerard Jones, and there's uh, the list of Gerard Jones that appear in, um, in the Library of Congress. And we try to include things that would allow Martha to make that decision. So who, you know, what, what was the source work for this person? What uh, other works they had worked on? The birth dates, death dates, if there were any um, professions, uh, fields of activity, things like that. And uh, this sped up, of course, uh, it was much faster process than having to page through the Library of Congress. So that was the idea. And here's another example for John L. Jackson. We also tried to include those that were um, closer, so closer matches like John L. Jackson would appear first um, in, in the uh, selector tool. Again, the idea was to um, make things as fast as possible. The result of Martha's work was to have generally two types of URIs associated with uh, contributors. One was a Library of Congress uh, URI. You can see here highlighted in red. And the other one was uh, an internal, it's actually an external uh, a public URI, but it was fed from our internal uh, content management system. We toyed with the idea of using Wikipedia or, um, or uh, VF. But we decided to just, for reasons of time and uh, expediency, we decided to use the internal database, but uh, having the sources uh, for that entry be um, well-documented. So that's, and also that uh, saved time when it came time to parse out different um, entries. For subject headings, of course, it's a little more complicated as we all know because uh, people are much con much more concrete than subject headings for a particular entry, but we knew this was important and we had some tools that we, um, we implemented that um, I think made the process much faster and hopefully better. Um, the easiest one probably was when once we had the, the, um, the authority name for a guest, 
and that guest happened to be listed as a as an author of a work, we use that by parsing the the um the entry for the work with the um URL for the guest, we use that to find the BitFrame work in Library of Congress and then use um, the subject headings associated with that work to generate now an XHTML document. And, uh, we'll, we switched to XHTML because we found it more robust with different browsers. But the idea was that if you're invited to a radio show because you wrote a book, um, you were probably going to cover the same topics that the book itself covers. So that's that was the idea. And it worked pretty well. Uh, you can see here an example, John Katz work, uh, sorry, is the author of a book uh, named Geeks. And these are the subject headings related to that work. And that was what would come out at the top. And incidentally, if there were several authors, um, we would use that segment, uh, that workflow a little farther down. Um, we also decided to incorporate in the in the XHTML document links to the um, JPEGs for the for the boxes of the items that were um, reformatted because sometimes they contain valuable information and of course uh, whenever possible we linked to the audio so Martha could make those decisions by listening to the um, entry. Sometimes the titles of the segments were a little too cute to really know uh, what, what in fact they were talking about. Um, when, L when LOC guests were not necessarily listed as authors of a specific work, we did the same thing only on the cumulative works that that person had um, created. So the idea was if a person, if a guest um, had several works associated with them, potentially the subject headings most commonly applied to that person's works would come up to the top. So if you're a physicist and you're invited to on the line, uh, there's a good chance that physics will be one of the topics that you will, uh, that you will be covering during that segment. So the same thing, um, we did the same kind of workflow. And then we also added things like affiliations, occupations, and fields of activity. And again, um, we use this cumulatively if there were several segment uh, guests. So here's an example, Eleanor Acer, maybe, I don't know how you pronounce their name, um, had uh, several works, but um, clearly this is a person that's, uh, whose expertise in, is in uh, asylums and refugees. So that came up towards the top, as you can see, and that allowed us to uh, select those subjects. For non-LOC guests, uh, it was a little more complicated and we used, we leveraged the um, a different um, workflow that we had used to convert our own web keywords to um, Library of Congress subject headings. We won't go into, into detail. The um, results were less than we hoped for because a lot of the web authors, uh, we're calling here web authors, meaning non-LOC guests, that we uh, were created by Martha from scratch. So there were no articles that were associated with yet. So, um, but the kind of the second half of the workflow does work. And here's a quick example of Howard Josepher, whose um, stories, what we call stories on WNYC included these tags. And then we, uh, from there, we, um, we kind of extracted the subject uh, headings from the Library of Congress. In reviewing the contributors and in, in the subjects, we realized that without normalized descriptions, it would be very hard uh, as a person looking at these catalog items to, to understand what was going on in each episode. So we implemented a step to normalize descriptions, taking existing information uh, from the producer database that we received that was contemporaneous to the run of the show and parsing out this information to implement a new format. So this included um, segment titles. It included, as you can see here, timestamps under each segment title and then guest names 
following asterisks and dashes to have their title and any other information in that database. Uh, so we hope this makes it a bit more readable in the future and just understanding at a glance what was in the episode, uh, preventing someone from having to listen to the full hour, although that can be its own fun and hopefully they can find the hour they need and then and then delve in. Um, we created a form to, to do this, in implementing this existing information uh, from the database to reformat and then allow for quicker human review. We'd now like to dive into the outcomes of this project as a whole, discussing the results of these tools, lessons learned along the way during this really iterative process, and discoveries we made as well. We'll begin with results. We had over 2,000 episodes cataloged, every episode we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we processed 9,392 contributors. We added over 6,000 Library of Congress name authority files for these contributors. Um, so 80% of these were found via a selector radio button, which means that the tool found the correct match. We did add in a bit over a thousand names manually into these forms from Library of Congress, uh, meaning that we we're glad we had that option at the end, you know, a free text box to enter that link. Uh, we also created 3,107 internal authorities, and we'll delve into this a bit further later. Um, but we we count this as a success, being able to identify all of the guests and, and have them be searchable and have these episodes in turn be discoverable through these names. And we were able to do the same for subjects. Um, we applied over 9,000 Library of Congress subject headings for over 9,000 segments, uh, 6,000 were manually entered, and then 4,400 were chosen via the checkboxes. So you can see this is a bit of a different rate of return. It means that 40% of um, the subject headings we found were found directly in the sub through the subject cloud in our forms. And I would guess that about 60% on top of that, um, or a little less than, were found indirectly. As Marcos mentioned, this form included not just the term, but the link to that term in Library of Congress, as well as broader, narrower, and related terms. So often, if it wasn't the term that was returned in our form, I was able to find it much more quickly than, you know, performing completely manual review uh, through the tool. And I also, this, this number is a bit different because I had to create kind of standardization across repeating topics, such as for the coverage of a New York mayoral election, I would decide, you know, the first time I reached it, uh, which subjects we'd like to use for that same election, and then copy and paste this over and over so that these episodes can be found when searching for that same subject. We wanted to give an overview, uh, just kind of a snapshot of the before and after of an asset description. You can see here that standardization we are discussing within the abstract on the left is the before, and obviously it's a much more hard to read. Uh, there are also guests, and there are multiple, multiple guests in one segment. Um, they would be kind of switched around and have this and breaking them up, but not necessarily clear which belong to which segment versus the format we implemented on the right. We tried to make absolutely clear the distinct segments as each show was broken up into many of these segments that they were often unrelated. So it's important to us to make that distinct. You'll also see the subjects added one by one, their strings, and the contributors on the bottom added one by one as well. This also led to a deduping process that allowed us to clean out duplicate records and correct misdated assets, which was very exciting to, to make more new discoveries there. Um, the SOLS process really tied back to user community needs at the forefront of digitization at New York Public Radio, uh, both internally allowing producers of the current Brian Lehrer show uh, to find episodes and, and clips and guests and internal searches as well, and then externally to, to provide resources and you know, discoverable episodes for future users of the digitized audio and searchers of our future digital asset management system. Uh, we did learn a few lessons along the way, as you do during any good project. Uh, we began in using HTML, um, beginning the process within Firefox, and with the first few segments, the HTML parser in Firefox removed aspects of the HTML file did not find necessary, such as closing tags required for the end XML file we wanted to implement to upload this information. Uh, so after a bit of research, we shifted to using XHTML, which maintains the XML structure while being able to be displayed in HTML to make our tool possible. Uh, the structure, display, and selections were all maintained, so we, we found that successful. 
Uh, it also allowed us to be really flexible. We kind of tailored each form at each phase, really being able to alter, you know, alter the form so that it was suited to both the cataloger and the collection, which was really helpful in making my process as quick and accurate as possible. Um, and this was designed to think about future collections. So it's been interesting to discuss along the way how it might be done differently for a different collection or a different cataloger. We also along the way realized we need to implement these internal authorities we've been discussing. There were guests that were not found in the Library of Congress name authority files that go beyond kind of non-public individuals. They included city officials, leaders of local organizations and community members. And as this volume became apparent, the internal New York Public Radio content management system was identified as a stopgap. It allowed us to create links that were internal to the organization, mean, meaning that they were somewhat stable and we owned what information, we, we were the only ones who could edit it. Um, in each profile, uh, this allowed us to collect information for new Library of Congress names. Um, there was an element of practicality and control, control over these pages um, that we could choose a format. They had to be authoritative, but the presentation didn't have to be strict or rigid. Uh, the end goal is, of course, to upload to the Library of Congress. Marcos is already working at this. We're part of the New York, New Jersey funnel, so he's been adding names one by one. Eventually, these CMS links will be replaced by Library of Congress name authority file links, which can be done in mass because they all have the same slug through our CMS. Um, if anyone has experience mass uploading, we obviously have over a thousand names to upload, so please find us afterwards. We'd love to talk more. Uh, we wanted to just give an example of the CMS entry on the next slide, uh, just to show we pulled the information from Wikipedia. Uh, there's no Library of Congress name linked to that Wikipedia entry, so here we have it at a glance uh, while offering the source of this information, and we have a clear link on our end for this guest. Um, the result of this process is that these important guests are now documented and the assets are described for immediate use using the stopgap with a clear workflow for replacing links and completing the authority work in the future. Uh, we wanted to end on a fun note with some discoveries. Uh, there are a few collection highlights that were only found through this cataloging process. On the left here, I broke down a few kind of categories of these discoveries. The first is alternative names. There were a few contributors who were identified by names that aren't their authority name that I was able to discover through this process. One example is Republican pollster Kellyanne Conway, who's an important figure now, um, who was, there's an interview under her maiden name, Kellyanne Fitzgerald, that we did not know existed until this process. Uh, there are also a few instances of Subjects being added as contributors that I was able to flag by being the person reviewing the cataloging tool. Uh, one big example is Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas were identified as contributors during the Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Thomas. And I, of course, doubted that this was true. So I was able to go in and listen and realize that they were in fact subjects and correct that, that information in the asset description. There are also a few false positives that kind of Followed the same format. Um, one memorable one is the guest Helmut Cole, who was identified under a, a segment about education. Helmut Cole is the former chancellor of Germany. It was actually Herbert Cole, a progressive alternative education teacher, which made a lot more sense. Uh, the cataloging tool flagged this and I listened and confirmed. Um, I also through this process was able to rediscover some guests and perform research into their career paths and where they are today. Uh, one strong example is Nisha Butler. We're about to listen to an interview with her. She was a high school athlete featured in one student's roundtable. Uh, by finding her authority link, I realized that she went on to become a WNBA athlete and sports reporter, uh, still active in the New York area. So here's a clip of her talking about her high school basketball career. What was the Super Six Classic shootout at Madison Square Garden? Oh, that was a... It was, I think, yeah, it was a super six. They had about a couple of teams played there, and there was a contest at, at halftime that they actually, uh, someone just submitted me in that, and it was, it was pretty fun. I was the only girl, and it was really amped. I was the crowd favorite, actually, and it was really nice, and I just had fun doing it, playing on the garden floor. I think you all should note that Nisha's the best high school basketball player in the city, boy or girl. <laughs> She's broken shooting records for either gender, and I think that's remarkable. So for all of these discoveries, human review was needed. Um, and as the human, I can say I was not exhausted and able to pay attention to these 
kind of red flags as I was going through with these examples that that something might be different than what was being described uh, because of the cataloging tool and how it was able to streamline and organize my work. Uh, now we wanted to save plenty of time for questions and discussion. As you see, we have even more clips to share if we'd like to, to hear those instead. Um, so please take some time, put your question or, or any other topic you want to discuss into the chat here or in Slack. Um, I know Marcos came up with a little game to start us off, just quizzing me about some subject headings. It's been a few months since when I was thinking and only subject heading strings, but I'll see if I can I can pull it back. Yeah, and, and I want to add, um, first of all, that all of this was done in one year, in case you didn't quite catch that, and that it was a joy to, to work with Martha. I think it was a lot of fun to develop these tools. Um, they were basically done with very, very little money, um, almost no money at all. And um, again, it was a very back and forth process. And uh, it was great to have someone working on uh, such a large project, but also kind of consistently apply the tools and being able to refine them uh, back and forth. So yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, we don't have any in the chat. We do have one from the live streaming that was posted in Slack. Um, okay. But first, I'll do the comment that was posted in Slack. There's so much awesome work covered in this presentation. Just wanted to say that. And then the question that was posted was, as one of the sources, does this refer, refer to Wikidaddy? Um, or does this refer to direct links from one of Wikipedia's pages content to another Wikipedia's pages content? Sorry, can you repeat um, as a... It says Wikipedia's link data. As one of the sources, does oh, this right. refer to Wikidata? Or does this refer to direct links from one Wikipedia pages content to another Wikipedia pages content? Yeah, our, our Wikipedia implementation was pretty uh, straightforward. It was basically URL to the Wikipedia page using um, the name um, of that person. Um, so that was there. We also added, a, I think, a Google, yeah, a Google search and an um, internal CMS search, just kind of parsing the name and using that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I, of course, might have been oh, answered sorry. on. Sorry, they said it might have been answered on slide 31. Not too familiar with Alice. Go ahead, Martha. Oh, I was just going to say, I often in my research, of course, found the Library of Congress name through uh, the Wikipedia entry as well. So having that linked data through the Wikipedia profile of the person was very, very helpful. Okay, there's a good question uh, about the LOC API. No, the LOC API does not allow as far as I know, uh, fuzzy matches, or if it does, we didn't implement that. So there was definitely a process, an iterative process of first cleaning up the data as well as we could uh, from the spreadsheet that we were given, and then um, kind of trying to make sense. Like sometimes the, the misspellings are pretty obvious. Um, so that was the first step. And then, uh, yeah, but that's as far as, as as we could take it. Google, of course, does fuzzy uh, match. So there was always the button for Google search that some many times would take it to Wikipedia. I hope that answered your question. The oh, the precision question. of the date of the match, for example, birthday. Yeah, we could do that. That is seldom uh, listed, but I could see a way where you could include the date so that it, if, you know, if someone uh, died in 1787, they were probably not a guest on the, on the, on the line uh, radio show. So you could ask, you could add that, uh, you could add, um, uh, yeah, a range of dates to make sure you only get people who are alive at that time. That wouldn't be too difficult to implement. Next question I see. How did you develop these tools, uh, developers, code, et cetera? Um, 
in this case, I'm the quote, quote unquote developer. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's all uh, XSLD style sheets, which we've been using for a long time because XML is basically the lingua franca among all of these systems and, and JSON to a lesser extent. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's how we, we, but again, it was all, you, you know, it's all very homebrewed um, and with very little money. The next one was the curious to know if this is a one-off project for WNYC. Or is there a broader linked data approach within the B, uh, PV Core community? Since they have worked with B, PV Core. That's a great question. So, probably my favorite, I'm not a huge fan of PV Core, but my favorite um, feature of the PV Core schema that includes an, a ref um, uh, attribute for contributors and subject headings. Mm -hmm. For a lot of things, actually, uh, which allows you to put a URL in, and um, so that's what we've used um, for PV Core uh, cataloging, which is what we use in our in our catalog. I will also say that we didn't mention this, but we are embedding the URLs to the Library of Congress in the audio files themselves, um, and that's something that I think is pretty innovative and it's worked pretty well. Uh, in fact, this week, we're gonna talk about this uh, at Audio Engineering Society because it's a way to kind of embed, um, embed the larger world into a specific file. Um, so if you are curious about what we're doing with that, uh, shoot me a line. What was your favorite tool used in your tool chain to complete this huge volume of work? All right, can you repeat just the beginning of that? What were your favorite tools that you used in this? Um, absolutely, our tool our, we built. Mm -hmm. I think that pulled together all the different elements I needed for my step in the process. I think particularly having the information parsed at the top, having the segment title right there, um, the guest, and then their you know title or book title or any other information that was included there. Having the original producer database was invaluable, and it would be interesting to think about this for a collection where we don't have that source material um, on the, the the developing the tool end, Marcos, what what did you enjoy using? Um, I think everything, <laughs> <laughs> everything is fun. And linked data really, um, I think it's very powerful. You know, you're leveraging the work of professionals um, in, and it, it kind of what I like about it is how broad or narrow you can get uh, with linked data. You know how, for example, one of the things we realized is that, for example, you have several guests, right? And each of those guests has written a lot of uh, books, say. So there's a lot of BitFrame works associated with them. And each one of those has a lot of uh, subject headings. And then you do this process cumulatively. Um, so at one point it became kind of unwieldy. So we had to narrow it to a certain number of works say, but it worked pretty well, even with a few works. Um, I'm sure it could be more um, accurate probably if we decided to take in all the works that those guests uh, were involved with, but it was pretty easy to narrow that and not have the system kind of be bogged down with that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and we're at that five minute mark. So let me get this last question in. Have you thought about possible use of speech to text conversion and the possibility of doing analysis on the text to extract subjects, realizing this might be more costly than we can afford? Yeah, you answered our questions. <laughs> yes. And, you know, um, Hopefully in the future, we will get speech to text for all of these materials. And I'd be very interested in seeing and doing a comparison analysis of what we came up with versus what um, uh, you know, machine learning speech to text uh, analysis can, can get. 
a big part of the reason why we did this is because we know it's applicable, like Martha said, to other shows. And in fact, there's probably shows that are better suited for this kind of work. I'm thinking specifically one that uh, included a lot of uh, writers, a lot of authors, uh, and many times um, specifically they, with they're talking about a specific book. So um, these are some of the things that we worked in. And also, like we mentioned earlier, um, the idea that uh, that the kind of uncontrolled keywords can be converted to like the kind of subject headings is something that is very, very attractive to us. Um, so that's those are kind of like little pieces of uh, code that we can reuse for other shows and in other uh, instances. So that's that's a big part of it too. Also from a cataloging perspective, we had many conversations about how this process provides a middle ground between listening to all 2000 episodes and adding information to very, you know, archaic version of that um, and having more advanced tools to, to perform more of analysis before the human review. Uh, so this allowed us, especially for a collection that we knew was so rich and we knew it would be high in demand with Brian Lair still on the air and with the 100th anniversary of your public radio, we wanted to not let, I, it's not let the perf perfect be the enemy of good, but it's instead letting, you know, budget be the enemy of getting something done. So this was a fantastic way to, to have this collection be accessible uh, before future processes are implemented. And there's also the aspect of control, right? These are tools that we, um, that we can control pretty well um, whereas things like um, machine uh, learning is a little fuzzier um, and sometimes you get, as you know, results that are not, you don't understand quite what that's happening. Whereas I feel like this was a good, um, a good balance between getting a lot of stuff done quickly and, uh, and having a human review it, if that makes any sense. Definitely. And I see we're just about out of time. So I'll just say thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. You'll see our email addresses here. Um, I'll also spend some time in the Slack this afternoon in case there are any questions you want to discuss in the group setting or, or you know, further discussions or you want to hear our bonus clips. You just let me know. Um, thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Marcos. This was great.